Okay, so here's the situation. Two 60 Symbols professors, Professor Merrifield and Professor Moriarty, both got in touch saying they wanted to talk about why the speed of light seemed to slow down through glass, essentially about refraction. So normally what would happen, I'd interview both of them, do some editing, chop it all together and make one video. But we're going to do something different this time. I'm going to show you both interviews pretty much unedited except for a few little cosmetic changes and cutting out a few of my questions where you didn't really need to hear my question. I'm going to let you watch them both. This video is Professor Merrifield and very shortly you'll be able to watch the one from Professor Moriarty. I want to do a video about refractive index, uh, N because um, it actually has a symbol apart from anything else, but also because it's something where we've done quite a lot of videos which mention refractive index and we talk about the speed of light when it's going through a medium through glass or something like that and we talk about the speed of light slowing down and invariably when we do that there's this sort of firestorm in the comments to the video all about people saying, ah, oh, but photons always travel at the speed of light, what's going on, why does the speed of light slow down and so on. Um, so I wanted to try and explain what's going on and the fact that the speed of light really does slow down when you're going through a medium. In crude terms, if you measure the speed of light in a vacuum, you always end up with the same answer, uh, 300,000 kilometers per second, or thereabouts C, okay? If you measure the speed of light in something else, air, glass, whatever it is, you'll get an answer. The, the refractive index is just defined as the ratio of those two numbers. So for example, the refractive index of glass is typically around 1.4, which means that uh, light travels about 40% slower in glass than it does in a vacuum. That much? Yeah. I always imagined it was just like a minuscule change. No, so in air it's like it's, you know, it's a fraction of a percent, so air really is, the speed of light really is very close to the speed of light, but in a, in a, in a fairly dense material like glass, yes, it's about 40% slower in the glass than it would be in a vacuum. So, I mean, it's responsible for all sorts of things. The reason why when you look through glass, you know, when you look at a straw in a glass of water, you see that the, the, the straw appears to be bent and so on. Uh, so all these things to do with the paths of light being bent are, are all to do with what happens when light goes from um, one refractive, a medium with one refractive index to a medium with un another refractive index. So from, for example, from air to glass or air to water. You wear glasses. Uh, I do, so, and you know, they wouldn't work if it weren't for refractive index because that's what bends the light, right? And so actually, yes, len the lenses wouldn't work. So lots and lots of physics really depends on refractive indices. So this always comes up with people say, oh, but well, you know, so people are quite reasonably happy with the idea of waves and maybe the waves slow down. But then you start thinking about photons, right? particles of light. Uh, and there's this view that a photon always travels at the speed of light. And so when people start thinking about this and say, well, how can it be when you've got your photons going through, if you think of the photon picture, when you've got your photons going through glass, why is it that, that they take longer to come out the other side? So the picture a lot of people have, let me draw a picture for you. So the picture a lot of people have is I've got a material rather than a vacuum. So I've got lots of atoms in there, right? all the atoms that make up. And maybe they'll be in a lattice if it's a solid, or they'll be randomly distributed if it's water. Or, you know, but there'll be just a bunch of atoms. So the picture a lot of people have is my particle of light comes in and kind of does a, a, a sort of... Um, a, a pinball. Pinball, that's the word I was looking okay, for. So, so the picture a lot of people have is that the light comes in and does a sort of pinball thing of bouncing around Okay, and then coming out the other side. And that sort of makes sense, right? Because if this thing is still travelling at the speed of light, obviously now it's travelled a longer path to get out the other side, and therefore it should take longer to come out the other side. The problem with that is if you think about it, if, so take, these glasses, uh, take glass as an example, where you've got this refractive index of around 1.4. That means that the path the thing has to travel along has to be something like instead of travelling straight through, it has to travel, you know, 40% further. That means it has to be sort of travelling on paths like this, right, in order to come out the other side 40% slower, because that's the angle that typically you have to be going for this path to be about 40% longer than the straight through path. Okay. Okay. The problem with that is that that would mean that some of the light will do that, and some of the light will come in and bounce this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, and then end up coming out that way. So what you'd expect, for the light coming out the far side in this case, is that the light should all be heading out in all sorts of different directions, just depending on what, what it happened to bounce off last. And of course that's not what happens. If you shine a laser into a piece of glass, then the laser beam comes in one side and it comes out the other side, and it's still a laser beam, still all pointed in the same direction. So this picture really doesn't work of thinking about this game of pinball going on, because if you start doing that, that should mean that the light really should be spreading out in all directions. But couldn't I think of it more as, instead of pinball, 
wading through treacle or honey and I'm just walking more slowly because it's harder for my legs to move through this viscous material. But then you have to, okay, so that's fine, but then you have to get, okay, so that's sort of a macroscopic view. Now let's go down to the microscopic view. What's happening? What's the light doing? when it interacts with the atoms. And, and there, there is another possibility, right? The other possibility that could be going on is, again, here's a bunch of atoms, and it could be that the light's coming in, it's getting absorbed by one of these atoms, it then sticks around for a little while until the atom chooses to re-emit the light again and send it on its way. And that's sort of, at the microscopic level, that's this sort of what's going on in a, a treacly picture, that things are just being delayed as they're going through. Again, there's a couple of problems with that. I mean, we know that atoms do absorb, atoms on their own absorb light. So this picture sort of works, that atoms do absorb light and then they'll re-emit it sometime later. There's two problems with that. Firstly, atoms tend to ab absorb light at very specific frequencies. And so you would then expect your refractive index to affect those particular frequencies a lot because the atoms are absorbing light at those particular frequencies and other frequencies not very much at all. So that means that the refractive index should vary dramatically depending on exactly what wavelength of light you're looking at. It doesn't happen that way. Refractive index does depend on the wavelength of light, but generally rather smoothly rather than this very kind of discrete way. The second problem with that is that that is, again, fundamentally a kind of a stochastic process, a random process. How many atoms did you happen to bump into in your way through? How long did each atom happen to delay the light for? Because how long a, 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 an atom takes to, when it absorbs a, a, a photon of light, how long it takes to re-emit it again is just a random process. That means that how long it takes a photon to get through um, should just depend on, in a fairly sort of random way. Sometimes they'll get through very quickly, sometimes they'll have more of a problem. Again, that's not what you find. When you measure that how, you know, you first turn on a light through a block of glass and measure when the first light comes out the other side, it's always the same amount of time. So again, you can't have any kind of stochastic process like that going on. All right then, you've convinced me that they're wrong. Tell me what's right. All right, this is where life starts getting very complicated. Because, oh, yeah, as if that wasn't complicated <laughs> enough. This is where things do start becoming a little more complicated because now we have to start thinking always with, it, with these microscopic systems. You can think about them classically or you can think about them in terms of quantum mechanics. And at some level, they're sort of both getting part of the picture. It's just like, you know, you can t treat a light sometimes like a wave, sometimes like a particle. Um, so we need to think about both possibilities. So let's start with the classical end of things, the wave end of things. What you've actually got in your solid is a whole bunch of atoms arranged in a lattice. As the light comes in as an electromagnetic wave, okay, it's a basically a varying electric field. That's going to jiggle all the atoms in this thing because they've got charges and so on. So all the electrons are going to get pulled around by that electric field as it goes past. And that's going to, when you then start moving these electric charges around, that means that each atom is going to respond by producing electromagnetic waves of its own. Okay, so the waves come in, they start jiggling the atoms around, which means that each of the waves will then start kind of oscillating in sympathy with the wave that's causing it. And it's the superposition of the wave coming in, coming through, the undisturbed wave, and all these sort of waves that are being created by the atoms that make up the material. When you add all those waves together, you end up with a, the, the final the wave that's actually propagating through the glass, and that wave is the one that's then travelling at less than the speed of light. Okay, so even if each individual wave that you're producing could be travelling at the speed of light, the, the kind of the superposition of them then creates something that's actually sort of is retarded. It hasn't travelled quite as far as you expected it to. So the net effect of adding the light that comes in with all the light that you end up generating through jiggling all the individual atoms produces this picture of a, the, the overall wave that you end up with by adding all that lot together is travelling slower. And the problem is, if you actually want to do what, you know, rather than just sitting here waving your hands about, if I actually wanted to show you that actually the speed that the, of the net result of adding all these waves together is to produce a wave which is travelling at less than the speed of light, that's a lot of maths. And so you can do it by solving the, you know, solving the equations of what happens if I add all these different waves together, each with different phase shifts and so on. Um, but it's just a mathematical mess to get to that point. So when, when Barry, the beam of light, entered a piece of glass, and, all, and, and started making all the bits of glass start jiggling, how did that then affect Barry the beam of light? It didn't, except, well, some of Barry's energy was lost because actually it was being used to jiggle all these other things around, so some of that light would have been lost for that reason. But it was then all these friends that Barry had created in the process, and the sum of all those different waves then created the net effect, the net wave that was travelling through the thing, which was then a wave which was travelling at less than the speed of light.
what is it about all those friends, all that extra waveness that was summed on to Barry that retarded him rather than enhancing him and making him faster? In fact, you can, in very peculiar circumstances, create things where you end up with a wave which is travelling faster than the speed of light in vacuum. Physicists tend to try and keep quiet about this because it makes life complicated. And it turns out, actually, you don't end up, you know, everyone gets worried because at that point you end up saying, am I breaking laws of physics, am I breaking relativity and so on. Actually, you don't because then you start saying, okay, so can I actually travel, transfer any information through this medium? Can I use this to actually get information to travel faster than the speed of light? And the answer is you can't because there's two types of, of speed for a wave. There's a thing called its phase speed, which is what actually I've been talking up to up till now about. There's also a thing called its group speed. And the group speed is if, for example, you wanted to produce a little pulse of light, how fast would that pulse propagate through? And the, the group speed, and that's what you'd need if you actually wanted to send information, because if I wanted to do Morse code or whatever, I've got to send little pulses of light through, right? The group speed always ends up less than the speed of light. The phase speed, under peculiar circumstances, can end up uh, faster than the speed of light rather than slower than the speed of light. So that, that's the classical explanation, okay? The simplest version of the quantum picture is to say, actually, it's kind of the same thing because the weird thing, so photons have really weird properties, right? For example, if you do this experiment of having two slits and you shine light through it, you end up creating an interference pattern um, just because the light that went through one fit, slit interferes with the light that went through another slit. So it's kind of the same, actually, story we were talking about before, that you actually end up with light carrying, traveling through different paths, interfering and producing a new phenomenon. But actually, if you think about things in terms of photons, even if you have a light source which is so weak that only one photon is going through at a time, you still create an interference pattern. And the only way we can understand that is if the photon actually went through both slits. So one particle manages to go through both slits at once. And that's, this is getting us into this weird quantum mechanical world. Okay, we can do the same thing with our solid of saying, okay, so if I think of my light as a bunch of photons, I can actually think of a photon following every possible path through this thing. And as it goes through, it interacts with each of the individual atoms, gets re-radiated, and what I see in, 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 uh, as the kind of the final light that this is producing is the, the superposition of all those things. The superposition of the light, the photon that came in undisturbed, but also all these other paths that it followed interacting with all the atoms on the way through. And that really is basically the same as the classical picture, where we're kind of each atom is sort of producing its own version of the light. Here it's just thinking about the photon following every possible path, and then those photons, that, that photon by following every possible path, ends up interfering with itself and creating a net effect of light that's travelling slower than the speed of light. Where do you draw the line, though? If, this, if our photon is going through every possible way and we add up the superposition, Every possible way seems like an infinite thing. It could have... It is. Yes, it's very clever how a photon manages to follow every possible path to get to where it's going. Nonetheless, that seems to be, when you do the maths of, say, what would I expect to see if that's the way that photons were behaving, and then look at the real universe, you find, actually, that's the way the real universe works. I understand you, you gave two, two scenarios there, this classical one, yep. uh, you know, the jiggling and the and the adding of the waves and that, and this um, quantum one, which is a bit more mind-bending, but nevertheless the maths works. The maths works for both of them. Yes. I accept that. Which one is actually happening? <laughs> that, so that's the problem with physics, right, is that physics, what we're doing is we're modelling reality. There's one reality, and you can have multiple models, and sometimes the models are exactly, or you know, as far as we can tell, there's no, you know, the models are entirely right. In other cases, each model kind of captures some aspect of reality. In this case, you can sort of explain the whole thing in terms of the quantum model. There are things you can't explain in the classical model. So in that sense, the quantum model is more right. But actually, the classical model is very helpful because it's much easier to picture. And actually, you don't end up with these mind-bending things of one photon following an infinite number of possible paths and those kinds of things. So actually, a lot of the time, it makes sense to think about things in terms of classical physics just because it's soluble, we can understand what's going on, we have a physical intuition for what's going on. But once in a while, you have to delve into the quantum mechanical explanation for things. Just to mess things up still further, there's another quantum way of looking at this, which is there's... Um, and, and again, it's this question of coming up with ways of modelling things. So I've just talked about two ways of modelling things. There's another way of modelling things that says, actually, a system that's a kind of a, a lattice or whatever that's in your, your material and the light travelling through it is completely different from just light in a vacuum. And so actually, we shouldn't just think of, you know, light in a vacuum we can explain as a photon. 
this combination of light plus the lattice and all the way that the lattice can be made to jiggle is a completely different system. And when we come to solve that completely different system, maybe we'll come up with a completely different particle rather than a photon as the, as the particle that's associated with light. And so physicists who study these systems have actually come up with a different way of mathematically formulating these things where there is a different kind of particle, a thing called a polariton. And a polariton is it's this complex combination of the oscillations of the electromagnetic waves, of the light, and the oscillations of all the stuff in the material it's passing through, combined together, produce this kind of particle. This kind of particle, the polariton, has mass. And because it has mass, that means it travels at less than the speed of light. So if you want a, a different way of thinking these things, but also a quantum mechanical one, is that your photon comes along. When it enters this medium, the maths that you're solving changes, and so actually the particle changes. And instead of being a photon, it becomes one of these things, a polariton. The polariton bimbles along at a bit less than the speed of light. And of course, when it comes out the other side, then once again, you're solving the regular equations of light in a vacuum or light in air. And that means that you can then treat it as a photon again, and it scoots off at the speed of light again. How do you expect me to edit this video? <laughs> I've, I've, I've told you the physics. The, the editing's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd like to see the Professor Moriarty interview, that will be available soon, unless you're watching in the future, in which case it's available now. Links in all the usual places. <laughs>